Hey, what's up, Lightbolt Joe here. Today we are going to discuss Final Destination 2. This came out in 2003. I was 13 years old. I remember distinctly. Uh, Allie Larder is back as uh, Clear Rivers in the in the sequel film. So it takes place a year later after the events of Flight 180 crashing. Uh, Devin Sawa's character of Alex uh, Browning uh, getting the premonition, trying to cheat death. The rest of the survivors trying to shoot death, everybody eventually having death catch up to them. So, why is Allie the why is Allie's character of Clear the only survivor then of the original tragedy, right? What makes her special? Because Alex's character, Devin's character of Alex, dies off screen. And we know this because of a Polaroid, we know this because of a, a newspaper article that uh, he's walking with clear down an alley and a brick falls hits him in the head and he dies why Devin I believe if I understand this correctly was having contract problems with uh with New Line trying to you know get a proper pay debt pay payment um because of him being the lead character but the writers then said no we were killing him off behind the scenes and I was like yeah it kind of doesn't make sense but whatever so of course I miss Devin because he's an awesome actor. And then we now have this new group who are evading the uh, massive pileup on a highway, right? And this is what I was referencing that still scares the crap out of us millennials all these, year late, all these years later, especially Long Islanders. Now, this is this takes place in, on Long Island. It's We have like a full map of the island because Allie's character of Clear is in a Stony Brook... Um, mental health facility. So we have the whole, you know, east, north, northeastern part of, no, excuse me. Yeah, northeastern part of our, the, the island on a map tracking how to track, uh, clear down and stuff like that. So we have this new main character. She has a premonition, you know, before getting on a highway um, of her and her friends dying and amongst a massive pileup, which is based on a massive pileup that was, that happened in 2002. It's just, it's creepy that, the death scenarios are based on actual real life death and like Devin's character of Alex's death being hit on the head from a falling brick is based on a woman's death who died in China, I believe in like the nineties or something like that. So again, it's just creepy that it's fictionalized real life deaths. Super weird, super creepy that it's still a like that it's, it, it happened. So it can happen. I think that's what really, is a trigger amongst horror fans uh, out there, especially on this series, because yes, yeah, some of the things are whimsical, some of the things are fantastical within the Rube Goldberg effect. Something rolls this way, slides into that thing, which collapses onto that thing, which severs that rope, which then swings that thing. It can happen, it's rare, but it can happen. And I think that's what's really, really terrifying that brings that horror aspect of it, because you're watching this and you're like, Oh my God, if they just stood three feet to the right, they would have missed this. Or would they have re-jumped onto death's list kind of a thing? So it's a question of, can you avoid death? You know, that one woman dying in the elevator, getting decapitated, creepy. That one kid getting smashed by the glass pane, creepy. Uh, what else? What else? Allie then being killed, her character clear, being killed because of oxygen exploding in the hospital. Uh, the concept of you could cheat death by bringing life but the pregnant woman didn't actually die in the in the in the premonition so the cycle still continues on but it was very interesting having that revelation of why them why was it all of them right so all of them were witness to uh one of the original six seven that survivors um that had died survivors of the flight 180 crash a year prior Either someone was on a bus that killed Terry's character, someone was here witnessing that. So it's like they witnessed death and then death put them in the chain and now they're on the list. Which then goes into the whole um, Smile film we just talked about. When you watch a tragedy, does death then follow you? So it's just so cool. It's so cool watching this. It's still terrifying all these years later. 20 years later, this film came out in 2003 and it's, it's, it's 2023. 20 years later... I still have problems driving on a highway with fear of something falling off the back of someone's truck and just de destroying people. It's, 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 you got to give credit when credit is due. If something has traumatized an entire generation for 20 years, for two decades, 
that's long lasting. That's that's pretty sufficient within the horror genre. That's pretty sufficient within the film industry in general to have that much of a psychological impact on a whole generation of, of people. Pretty impressive. Terrifying, but impressive. And again, it's that whole um uh what's the what's the what's the term? Stream of consciousness, the SOC, the SOC. Um how all of us millennials are in that SOC, that we're in that sock of fear driving on a highway on Long Island in back of a truck. It's creepy. Psychology's weird, man. It's it's weird. It's cool, but it's terrifying. The brain is just filled with chemicals and stuff happens and synapses fire and all of a sudden you can think a certain way and it's just, it's creepy. It's very creepy. It's very creepy. I want to know more about fear so going on to fear and the terror aspect of it, we're going into the third part. Uh, I don't think I saw four and five. I know I, I definitely saw three. I don't know about four, but we're going to revisit them. We're going to revisit them. Uh, we're going to see if any memories trigger. On to the next review. Winter Mahalo.